Okay, so welcome everybody. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our um, event um, titled Remembering Sara Ejazi, Queer Morning and Militancy in the MENA. Uh, my name is Paola Rivetti. I'm the chairperson of the Outreach and Pedagogy Committee, which is the committee that is organizing this, uh, this event. Uh, my heartfelt thanks uh, in particular go to um, Sophie Shama and Sabia Halush, who've been organizing and working uh, to bring together this fantastic um, pool of speakers that we, we, we are very, very eager to, to listen uh, to today. Uh, so um, what I would like to do is introduce the two chairs and then I will give them the floor. Um, so Sophie Shama is a lecturer in gender study at SOAS, University of London. Their research sits at the intersection of feminist and queer political theory, Middle East studies, political economy, and cultural studies. Their work is focused on the study of the life, death, and afterlife of the radical political imagination in the Middle East and its diaspora from a queer feminist lens. Sabia Halush is a lecturer in Middle East studies based at the Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter, where she specialized in the study of gender and sexuality in relation to the so-called Middle East. Sabia is particularly interested in the question of how society and the state continuously construct, deconstruct, and reconstruct the category of gender and what implication this has on women, marginalized youth, and non-normative bodies. Uh, before giving the floor to our speakers and two chairs, uh, I'd like to just flag that the committee is organizing events in the, for, the, um, uh, for the incoming year, academic year at least, uh, in September. So please keep an eye on, um, on Brisma's website, um, and the and our social media accounts to know more about our future events. Um, Sabiha, Sophie, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Paula. Um, and um, hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. So we we've come together today to commemorate the late Sada Higazi. Um, Sada was a queer feminist, communist activist from Egypt who uh, sadly took her own life in exile in Canada on June 14th, 2020. Um, as mentioned in the promotional material for this event, uh, Sada was one of many uh, subjected to the horrors of the moral panic launched by the Egyptian state in the aftermath of what has come to be known as the rainbow flag incident. Um, this involved the targeting, arrest, and abuse of people identified as or suspected of being queer in Cairo after rainbow flags were waved at a Mashrua Leila concert in 2017. So today we've brought together a panel of queer feminist activists from the MENA region to reflect on the political processes and forces that drove Sada to suicide, but also and crucially to think through and with her legacy. So with us today are Sara Mrad, Ghiwa Sayikh, and Malak Al Kashif. Malak is the executive director for Transat Mina organization, and she also works as a journalist and researcher. Sara is a writer and assistant professor of media studies at the American University of Beirut, where she co-directs the Women and Gender Studies program. Her scholarship and writings on feminism, sexual politics, and Arab media and public cultures have appeared in a number of academic journals and media platforms. And her current book project threads life writing, oral history, cultural criticism, and theory to explore the violent histories that bind us to place and people and the ambivalent intimacies through which we inhabit the unlivable spaces we call home. Sara is a co-investigator on the OSF ACSS funded project mapping the production of knowledge on women and gender in the Arab region and her other collaborative projects on pedagogy in times of struggle um, and transnational feminist and queer solidarities are supported through the Open Society University Network. Sara received her PhD in communication at the University of Pennsylvania and in 2018 she was a global visiting fellow at the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at New York University. In 2021-2022, she, she was an EUME postdoc fellow at the Forum for Transregional Studies in Berlin. And finally, Hiwa is an anarcha queer writer, independent publisher, and editor from Beirut. 
They are the founding editor of Kohol, a journal for body and gender research, and the co-founder of Intersectional Knowledge Publishers. They hold an MA in gender studies from the University of Paris 8. And their first book on perverse orientations is forthcoming in the Sorcières collection of um, Cambaracus Press. So just a few remarks before I hand over to Sabiha and then the panelists. Um, so as I said earlier, uh, today we've come together to honor what Sara Higazi stood for and what she worked tirelessly to achieve. Um, we, um, um, we've come together uh, to honor her vision of Amina that could have been and could still be otherwise, and her astute framing of power and oppression in Amina that was attentive to the interconnectedness of seemingly disparate experiences of subjugation and violence. Um, we've also come here to honor her dedication to imagining and working to build brick by brick an Egypt and a region more broadly, where the link between power and the production of deviants could be revealed and challenged from multiple fronts in order to cultivate Amina for all its people. We've also come together to reflect on the political potential of grief and militant mourning. In this case, particularly a queer militancy rooted and spurred by mourning, which is a transnational political tradition that in its MENA manifestation has been paid little attention. We want to address the mechanisms that oppressed Sara and forced her to conclude, as she wrote on Instagram the day before her suicide, that the sky is sweeter than the earth, that she wanted the sky and not the earth. But we don't want to limit our discussion to oppression and violence directed at queer people in the MENA. We don't want to reduce them to this experience of violence and therefore to victimhood. So in honor of Sada and her enduring legacy, we want to use this opportunity to reflect on the ways in which queer subjects in the region not merely survive, but cultivate a culture of resistance, a shared and intersectional political subjectivity, and a means of thriving through political dedication and community by holding onto and becoming with the ghosts of those who, who have been taken from us. So we've decided to structure this as a conversation rather than a series of interventions. So Sabiha and I as chairs will pose some introductory questions to our panelists. And our hope is that we can build off each other and develop an organic conversation from which we can all benefit. From there, we'll, we'll open it up to you, the audience to join us. But as we speak, please feel free to post questions in the chat um, and we'll address these towards the end of the, of the event. Now I'll hand over to Sabiha for her to add any other introductory remarks and to pose the first question to our panelists. Uh, one of our panelists, Malak, uh, will be speaking in Arabic um, and following her interventions, um, Sabiha will translate for those that don't speak um, Arabic. Um, Sabiha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you, the audience. Uh, thank you for the great introduction. And um, um, I think I would add to it that um, so in addition, right, to what uh, Sophie was telling us about uh, the uses of this place, right, to um, to think about uh, queerness and sexuality beyond, beyond violence, um, maybe it's also a, a space to rethink, right, about uh, resistance, but also how to forge uh, solidarities, especially across uh, different uh, contexts. And I think this is particularly important in this age, right, of... Uh, Moral panics that are becoming increasingly, uh, uh, like increasingly assembling weird alliances, uh, weird uh, strange bedfellows, right? That historically would not necessarily um, converge, right, on these matters, but uh, in, they are increasingly so. And I think, you know, by by identifying, um, you know, how these different um, categories are always subjected to state power it can help us um, think right about how we think about them but also what to do at certain point and um, so this of course would mean even though we are today uh, uh, remembering Sarah uh, Higazi and of course when we talk thinking about sexuality we're thinking about queerness but we also have to think about how moral panics is oftentimes co-opted by the state and manufactured right beyond queer sexuality. It could be more or less uh, anybody, right? Depending on their class, migratory status, et cetera, et cetera. And not all bodies get equally um, secure, uh, securitized. So yeah, and even though this, you know, this is uh, sounds maybe more heavy, but I think this is part of the conversation in identifying right all these uh, spaces and 
eventually putting them uh, in conversation together through our activism. And um, without further ado, I'm going to begin with the, uh, the first question. Um, it's quite lengthy. The queer response to Sarah's death, uh, at least in its public dimension, was unprecedented. Uh, what was it about this loss that you think provoked such a mass and public response from queer people in the MENA and its diaspora? And the question is for all our uh, uh, panelists. Sabiha, can you just do a quick translation of the question into Arabic? Of course. So um, the question, um, so a سؤال هو إنه بعد موت سارة كان في ردة فعل ملحوظة جدا وقوية من بمختلف المساحات الكويرية يلي من الميدل إيست بس كمان بالدياسبوراز تابعينه فكيف فينا نفهم أو ما هو التفسير لها ردة الفعل يلي كانت غير ملحوظة للحظتها Who would like to go first? I see Malak. أكيد أنا كنت حاسة أدو بس ميني كلام الأول. طيب هو إحنا طبعا كان في ردة فعل دعمة وردة فعل من مجتمع ال LGBT نفسه وردة فعل كانت مختلفة عن اللي تعودنا نشوفه في الميدل إيست. هسيبك هسيبك فواصل بينك خلينا عشان تترجمي. Yes, so uh, Malak is saying, uh, indeed, there has been an unprecedented reaction and response uh, from the LGBT uh, sphere in uh, Egypt and across the region. But we also don't forget that when we were born, the government was on a level of extreme, not just in Egypt, but also on the Muslims and the Muslims. The political reaction, because in Egypt, there was a project for the Supreme Court. We don't have a legal law, so the Muslims are on the basis of the Muslim people, because after the Muslims, the government was on the basis of the Muslim people, and the Muslims were on the basis of the Muslim people, and the Muslims were on the basis of the Muslim people, and the Muslims were on the basis of the Muslim people, and the Muslims were on the basis of the Muslim people, and the Muslims were on the basis of the Muslim people, and the Muslims were on the basis of the Muslim people, so we had translate to English. I'm oh, so sorry, guys. I'm so sorry. Yes, the, so the reaction was also uh, noticeable at the uh, regional level, right? So not only at the local Egyptian level, but also across uh, the, the region. And, um, um, but also apart from the public, uh, there was also an unprecedented uh, degree, right, of violence uh, by, the, by the state. And following the uh, rainbow incident and uh, Sarah's murder, um, this is when we started having a serious conversation about uh, uh, producing um, and laws that specifically target uh, queer sexualities, as opposed to the more or less ambivalent uh, existing laws in the case of uh, uh, Egypt. Thank you, Malak. Well, the truth is اللي كان اكثر اكثر ردود فعل كانت مبهره هي الكامينج اوت لاشخاص عندهم 16 و17 و18 سنه هم اشخاص جيز لاسبيانز ترانس في مصر وده مش 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 متعارف عليه وما بيحصلش بس لو هنسال ليه ده حصل ليه ساره خدت ردود الفعل دي احنا ما نقدرش ننسى ان قضيه ساره كان كانت قضيه محط انظار دوليه ما كانش قضيه يعني زي القضايا احنا طول الوقت عندنا في مصر قضايا قبض على مثليين وترانس بس كمان قضيه ساره اتقبض على 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 75 شخص غير ساره حجازي واحمد علاء في القضيه دي وده كان سوشيال بانيك في في مصر وفي المنطقه كلها لانه احنا على الاقل اخبارنا بتوصل يعني في منطقتنا اخبار بتوصل لبعض فانا اعتقد انه جزء من تضامن الناس وظهور وانه الاشخاص الكوير خدوا خطوه بعد وفاه ساره خطوه الظهور الدعم المناصره الخ 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 كانت بسبب القصه التراجيديا المتابعه من من اول لحظه فيها وهي لحظه القاء القبض عليها. 
thank you, Malak. So another uh, explanation, right, in thinking about uh, this uh, reaction is um, um, thinking about um, um, the international uh, coverage that uh, Sarah Higazi's uh, death had uh, in the international media, but also uh, the international global LGBT spheres. And um, Malak also told us that um, there was a wave of young, uh, very young queers, self-identifying queer uh, in Egypt uh, coming out, uh, coming out, and I use it uh, reasonably as we, we, but they did come out um, to affirm uh, their sexuality in the face uh, of what was uh, happening. And um, yeah, right, and it was 75 individuals. So it was, uh, um, yeah, it wasn't a small uh, uh, number. Malak? Ah, oh, shukran. Ana kida khalas. Merci, Samiha. Shukran. So, maybe... so I think I can, I can respond um, next. I will thank you for the invitation uh, to Sophie and Sabiha and um, others who have had to organize this. Um, I think. I mean, Malek already started by providing some of the, you know, the context for, for what happened. Um, and as she was saying, this, the response wasn't just to the announcement of Sarah's death um, by suicide. This was an unfolding story that was unraveling over the years. And, um, you know, there's a, it's a tragedy, there's a tragic element to it. And so, People, even people who didn't know Sarah before had met her when the news had met her um, um, virtually uh, through the um, through what happened at the Mashru Alayla concert. And many started following her story then. So for me, one of the, to respond to the, the, the question about the responses that um, you know, stayed with us. For me, it was all the testimonies that were um, being shared online. I can't remember what was the name of the page exactly. Um, but that's where I read a lot of testimonies about Sarah, but also about, um, I, I remember one of her friends, someone who knew her, who was there at the concert, um, talking about the moment the moment that she, the, 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 the moments preceding the raising of the flag um, and, and what Sara looked like, what she was saying, um, and then also reflecting on that moment, um, which was caught on um, camera and which basically um, eventually led to the, the, you know, to her, to her demise. And so for me capturing, because a lot of the responses afterwards um, it, it were about, uh, you know, didn't she know better than to raise a rainbow flag? Um, and this is, I think, something that we can talk about more. Um, and uh, so about the, the political risks that she had taken. Um, and then, you know, this devolves as it usually does into what amounts to victim blaming, different, different uh, ways of blaming the victim in these cases. Um, and so these testimonies, at least this one, um, were an invitation to beyond, you know, talking about the risk and the safety and the security, to think about the, um, the raising of the flag as a political gesture and to really think about it. Um, and, and to think about it outside the ready-made um queer critiques that uh, that that emerge from this region about visibility politics um which is also something we can talk about um but i think so so there's there's that in terms of the responses but i think part of the answer um also is in the spaces in which this morning this grieving um happened which is online and so I think that there's a lot to be said about um, the sort of the 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 the, the platformization of countercultures, the uh, the acceleration of this process over the last decade, um, um, 
there were publics that were responding, that were forming around this death and that were responding. Um, and I think it was, and this is maybe the last point I will say is, um, it was a very public suicide. So we're not talking about a, a private death. We're talking about um, a public person who left a suicide note, addressing her friends, her, her comrades, the world at large. Um, so there was an addressee there at the moment of death. And I think a lot of people were responding um, because they felt interpolated, um, particularly queer people. Thank you, uh, Sara and Malak. Uh, thank you, Sophie and Sabiha as well for uh, giving the space for this con conversation. It, it is uh, quite an emotional moment to go back to, you know, uh, that the news that, you know, uh, we all heard of um, exactly three years ago. And I think I would like to continue with the same spirit as uh, what has been said already in terms of context. Um, and I think that what Sara symbolized at that moment was literally this, what Sara was just, um, Sara on the panel was just saying, in terms of the shift of um, trying to think through visibility politics as revolutionary politics. So the conversation really shifted uh, or was shifting at that point, because if we look at the broader context of what was going on regionally and transnationally, then uh, there's the notion of uh, what had happened to regional revolutions at this point, uh, whether in Egypt, like throughout the years, but also in, in Lebanon, um, in Syria, in Palestine, um, and how revolutions kind of uh, put us face to face with the system that we were trying to dismantle and realizing what the system can actually do and the damage that it does on um, individuals beyond visibility politics. Um, we were also at a time of great isolation, which is also why a lot of the responses happened online. Uh, it was, you know, at the end of the first lockdown, like the first COVID lockdown in many, many different contexts. Um, and during COVID itself, what had happened was that a lot of the revolution that we usually see in terms of mobilizations and you know, the visibility of it, to go back to the visibility uh, conversation, uh, was completely crushed and taken out of the streets. So uh, with those new modes of organizing came also a new mode of, of responding and reacting that was uh, different. But that is, not, that is not the only story. The story is that um, I think that Sara at that point was a rallying point uh, to express what the system does to us uh, in different ways. So uh, locally, there, like we cannot not talk about prison and incarceration as a response to um, a controlling population and moral panics being uh, one element that, as Sabi has said at the beginning, are actually uh, they're not just randomly there. You know, they're tools uh, that are mobilized uh, in specific ways. Um, and then there's illness um, and how, you know, going back to Sarah's politics that were also communist leftist politics, you know, looking at illness as something that is actively sustained and produced by capitalism and other systems of power. Um, and how this is treated in terms of care, uh, like there is no care, you know, to go back to sick woman theory, uh, John had the sick, sick woman theory, that there will be no care provided um, uh, to uh, the, sick, the, the figure of the sick woman because this is what allows capitalism to sustain and therefore care becomes something that is practiced within communities, within uh, smaller communities. And very often, like, we do our best, but it's, it's still not enough. Um, so that was the second thing, incarceration, uh, illness, and then exile. And if we look at uh, migration waves, uh, particularly now, we can see that, you know, uh, different crises, economic crises, have in intensified those migration waves, um, therefore isolating people in different ways, whether by, you know, uh, like moving them out of 
certain geographies, placing them into others, thinking that by doing so they would be safe or safer. And actually this comes with uh, having lived that myself a couple of months after Sarah's death, actually, it comes with incredible isolation and precarity, but also being completely cut off from whatever system of care was already there. So I think that Sarah's politics symbolized um, revolutionary hope and the fact that, uh, that you know, it ended in this tragedy um, also meant that we could rally around uh, incarceration, illness, uh, and exile and isolation, not as things that we want to maintain, but as, you know, recognizing what the, um, what the evils are in a way, uh, and they are no longer just around visibility politics. It's really about how is it that we can um, look at the various systems in the face, uh, and how is it that we then mobilize um, as revolutionary hope um, and as mourning, actually, because they both go hand in hand. Thank you so much, Rila, um, Sarah, and Malak for those uh, really rich interventions. Um, I I want to um, have to kind of to continue this conversation around visibility because I think it's it's quite important. Um, and I but I just wanted to kind of reflect a little bit on on some of the things that were said. I think what was so per particular um, and powerful about this moment in terms of the, the way that grief was articulated to build on what Malak was saying was the language that was used in response to both the rainbow flag incident and then Sara's death wasn't merely the language of human rights abuses, but the there was an insistence on political analysis, right? So this was being framed as a moral panic that had its roots in a kind of distraction politics, right? So there was a political analysis emerging via the means through which people grieved, particularly the insistence that um, Sada had been killed by the Egyptian state and that Egyptian society at large was complicit in that murder. That framing um, and the kind of thinking about social panics, moral panics, and why they're happening um, um, and why queer people are being scapegoated in particular ways. I think that that was a really um, important part of the discourse um, um, that emerged after, after both of these um, um, incidents. Um, and then to, but the kind of sort of question I wanna pose or what I'd like to hear you talk about a little bit more is how, how both the rainbow flag incident and then um, uh, Sada's death undermines or causes, you know, forces us to question this binary that's been kind of prevalent when people talk about queer life in um, in the MENA between visibility and invisi invisibil invisibility politics, uh, so-called authentic ways of being queer and doing queer politics and Western ways of being queer and doing queer politics. Um, and I I'd like to also hear you reflect on what it is also what it was about her person and her politics to build off what Hua was saying that actually also causes this um, the, the, this disruption within this binary. Um, because another thing that was very central in the testimonies that were written um, was the insistence on the kind of political subject she was and the kind of political vision she had. And I think that that was central to forcing a rethinking of what is visibility um, and what kind of symbols we can utilize, we can and should utilize. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if anybody wants to uh, start off um, elaborating on that. Maybe I can start, Sophie, by saying that um, it's very as as important as a critique of visibility has has been continues to be. Um, I think particularly with um, what happened with Sarah um, and the and and the discussions around the meaning of of raising the the raising a flag um, in a public uh, space, but also the meaning of the rainbow flag itself as a symbol of of dissent. Um, 
the, and the question that's with this critique of visibility politics is, is why, why do we announce or do we have to announce our difference? Um, and, and what difference does it make and, and, and what forms um, should we adopt? And um, the critique often you know, slides into or equates um, such gestures with like, um, you know, going for identity politics. Uh, and, and identity politics being the sort of anti-political uh, um, example of, of, um, of a politics of a bad kind. But I think one of the things um, we should do is to situate um, the politics of visibility in, in its context. Um, and this is a context where, if we're talking about Egypt specifically, um, uh, where dissidence is forced into disappearance in so many different ways. Uh, we can think of Egypt as a, as a you know, a big, uh, a big prison. We can think of, of, of all the forms and ways in which dissidents have been made to disappear. And in, in, in um, by extension, in which dissent has been made to disappear for, so, so for me, this insistence on appearing um, is, when we situate it in context, um, it's this is part of what the queer. If we were thinking about what the struggles, the political struggles, queer struggles today are, it is about the right to to exist and to dissent in public. So I want us to to think about this as we're thinking and where we rehearse this. You know, the critique of visibility politics, um, because it is precisely a struggle for visibility. Um, it's not about rights. In the first place, it's about the uh, the right to appear and the right for dissent to have a space in which it, it can appear. Thank you, Sara. Um, Sabiha, can I just ask you to translate for Malik? Thank you. The question. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sara. So, uh, Malik, the question is about, um, you know, uh, visibility. I think uh, when you were first, first speaking, you told us yeah. about the visibility. Yeah, a lot of it. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Malak, the question is you know, the discourse about visibility in Masr, Kif Mauta Lasara Asar Ahal discourse you know كيف نحن بنفهمه كيف الاكتيفست بيفهموه كيف الثيوريست سكولرز بيفهموه اتسترا اسف سميح ممكن تعيدي السؤال يا السؤال بيحكي عن الفيزيبيليتي بعد موتى لساره كيف تغير مفهومنا للبوليتكس اوف فيزيبيليتي يعني حدا يساعدني فيزيبيليتي اي دونت نو يا ست الظهور يا اوكي طيب هي انه هو انه الناس بس تفرق بين انه انه كيف كيف الشخص لازم يكون ال جي بي تي عنا بالمنطقه وكيف ال كيف الاجانب بيكونوا ال جي بي تي انه يعني coming out و in public with rainbow flag وانه كيف يعني كيف بعد موت ساره وبعد ال بعد الانسدنت بمصر هيدا الشيء انه it becomes destabilized I don't know how to translate that صبيحه اوكي okay. طيب هو ازاي ازاي موت ساره اثر على سياسات الظهور في المنطقه مش مش هتكلم عن مصر بس لانه كمان موت ساره ما كانش ما كانش حدث مرتبط بمصر بس ما كانش حدث مرتبط بالعنف في مصر بالقوانين في مصر بالتعرضات لساره في مصر لان ساره ماتت بره مصر اصلا فهي ما قدرتش تتخطى السياق ساره طول الوقت لما كانت بتكلمني او بتكلم اشخاص تانيين من اصدقائها كنا طول الوقت بنتناقش في فكره انه ازاي ساره مش قادره تخرج الوطن طول الوقت لما كنا بنتكلم انا وهي كانت بتتناقش في فكره حوالين ان هي مستنيه تاخد الجنسيه عشان تقدر ترجع مصر بشكل امن فتبتدي شغل تاني فيها ف الموت ساره كان حدث اقليمي وحدث دولي كمان للاشخاص ال جي بي تي من منطقه الشرق الاوسط وشمال افريقيا اللي بره المنطقه ممكن صبيحه ترجمي عشان يا كمان ملك كنت عم تقول انه sorry it's in English I'm I'm not sure what's happening I apologize um, I am here but uh, yeah so um, um, you know the the, the so Malak, um, she's remembering um, when she used to speak right uh, with Sarah 
prior to her death in uh, Canada. And uh, Sarah actually had uh, uh, plans uh, to eventually return to Egypt, um, you know, to start uh, her, her projects, her plans, uh, etc. And um, again, uh, Malak asserted that, um, you know, the whole, uh, all the narratives, right, that accompanied Sarah's death were again uh, at the, uh, happening at a global uh, level. لكن وموت سارة والحادثة الريمبو الحقيقة لأنه أنا بالنسبة لي الواقعتين مش منفصلتين عن بعض لأنه الريمبو فلاك كانت من أكبر الأحداث اللي حصلت للـ LGBT في مصر بعد كوين بوت 2001 وموت سارة أثر على الـ visibility ووجود الـ LGBT وسياسة الظهور في المنطقة على مستويين الشخصي والسياسي yeah, and it's uh, important here to remember that um, the historical antecedent, right, of the arrest of these 75 uh, queer individuals or suspected of queerness, which happened in the 90s with the Queen Boat incident. Um, and uh, this was um, this was going to uh, evidently leave um, impact, right, the, the politics of visibility, both at the uh, a political institutional level but also at the social uh, slash uh, individual level المستوى الشخصي كان ان الافراد بقى عندهم بقى 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 في احساس بانه كل حد فينا عنده ساره انا انا ساره حجازي كانت في حياتي شخصيا بس انا كمان غير ساره انا ليا ثلاث اصدقاء ثانيين انتحروا لاسباب مشابهه ومختلفه عن اسباب ساره كانت كلها تتعلق بان هم افراد من المجتمع الال جي بي تي كل حد هنا عنده ساره في حياته وكل حد بعد حادثه ساره خاف يكون ساره فما بقاش الـ 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 التخفي او عدم الظهور اختيار على قد ما هو بقى ديفنس ميكانيزم انا لازم اظهر دلوقتي واقول ان انا هنا دلوقتي عشان ما يتمش تهميشي بكره Thank you, uh, Malak. Yeah, this is, um, so Malak is sharing with us uh, quite uh, intimate, right, narratives in the sense that uh, for uh, most and each of the uh, queer individuals in Egypt, um, everyone, like there was a Sarah, right, either in the sense that everyone knew of a Sarah-like or they themselves, right, could at any uh, point, at any moment, become uh, Sarah uh, uh, Higazi in terms of, uh, you know, uh, living life slash death, uh, uh, livability, right, uh, etc. But she also tells us that, and I, I found this paradoxical, and if I'm uh, translating this uh, wrongly, please correct me, Riwa and uh, Sarah and Sophie and everyone. So, right, this idea that to what, how long does one remain invisible, right? Um, um, so it, it becomes a more a defense mechanism uh, to stand up to both state and uh, society, whether you make yourself visible or you don't make yourself, uh, you know, visible. Because sooner or later, the state, right, and uh, the apparatus is going to catch up with you. Well, في جزء لا يمكن ان نتجاهله لو لا احنا احنا انا مش عايزه اكون بخلي موت ساره رومانسي ويتم تذكره على انه نضار رومانسي سياسي على قد ما انه الشق العام الخاص بتاثير ساره على الفيزابيلتي لسه 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 الشرطه والحكومه المصريه بتعمل كل يوم ساره لسه قضايا ال ال جي بي تي لسه ستات ترانس بتقبض عليها لسه مثليين ومثليات بتقبض عليهم كل يوم في مختلف محافظات مصر ولسه ناس بتاخد احكام بتبتدي من ست شهور وتوصل لحد 12 سنه سجن وده بيخلق كل يوم ساره فهو للاسف الفيزبيلتي في مصر ما بقتش اوبشن لانه هي 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 احنا ممكن ان كلنا النهارده نبقى فيزبل لكن الضريبه بتاعت الفيزبيلتي نفسها بعد موت ساره اللي خلى الشرطه المصريه والحكومه تبص لنا بنظره اكثر متابعه واكثر بحثا عننا واكثر مطارده لينا خلى انه ضريبه الظهور نفسها بقت عاليه Thank you, uh, Malak. So, 
Manak is also telling us that um, in following the death of uh, Sarah, the Egyptian state uh, opted for a more, um, um, you know, inquisitive uh, approach, um, you know, but one that scans, let's say, and uh, detect, right, uh, through, of course, its apparatus of uh, police and other surveillance uh, mechanism mechanisms. And um, Malak said that uh, the arrest can sometimes be accompanied with uh, imprisonment that could range from six months to 12 months. And this is happening uh, in all the provinces of Egypt, not limited uh, you know, to the more uh, known cities and spaces. And uh, actually, if I could add, so, and this made me think uh, when, when Sophie was, um, yeah, was, oh yeah, and one very important, also think that uh, Malak told us, right, that um, um, in as much as we have to appreciate uh, the nuances, right, around the, the killing of uh, Sarah, um, we really have to, um, um, to be careful, right, not to uh, romanticize it uh, or not to view it as, uh, um, yeah, to idealize it, right, as, uh, yeah, something romantic that can be easily right discussed or talked about as opposed to the nuances we are uh, talking about but yeah, if i can go back to what i wanted to add um, so because i was thinking right about the a little bit the overlaps but also discrepancies about the queen boat incident some two decades ago and the more recent arrests and it also makes me think right about uh, uh, the work of sophie on the the state um, like what was different about these 75 arrests, right? These are mostly Kyrene, urban, university educated kids, right? At a concert for Mashrua Layla. And um, this was, you know, this was a category that was more difficult for the state to co opt and securitize as opposed to the lower class arrest, right? That accompanied uh, the Queen Boat uh, incident. And, um, yeah, so, and I think this links directly with what Malak was telling us, right, that like the extent to which the continuum that the uh, Egyptian state is very firmly uh, uh, manufacturing uh, in terms of surveying uh, LGBT bodies, and uh, also Malak mentioned trans, right, and here maybe we can think a little bit diasporically, transnationally, um, with all the trans uh, panic uh, happening I think in different parts of the world. So, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I find it really, I mean, we're always, you know, we come up against this discourse that any and all visibility politics, as uh, Sara was saying, and Sophie's question, um, is necessarily like somehow Western or whatever. Um, and actually, uh, our politics as queer people who have been politicized in the global south are not viable in the so-called West. Um, it is very hard to build bridges in any way, actually, with um, this proximity to empire that happens. And I think that people who have been politicized um, elsewhere and who arrive as migrants do experience this uh, over and over again. So the viable political, you know, like most of the viable political uh, bridges that do happen are amongst migrants elsewhere. Um, and this was made like much more difficult with, you know, again, going back to the isolation around COVID and, and all of that. This is not to say that there isn't a state politics uh, that implements and co-opts visibility and rights in relation to LGBT. Um, in order to maintain a world order that for me has very much uh, to do with migration politics. So I can think of many scholars, Sabiha included, uh, Fadi Saleh, who have talked about, you know, having to perform a certain misery narrative in order to access uh, migration status in many different, uh, you know, contexts of, again, what is known as the West. 
And this comes really as, you know, a, a, a new form of population control that instrumentalizes queerness and sexuality in order to uh, uh, put into effect a politics of, of division and, uh, and cleansing in some way. And I think this is relevant because it ties very well with, with Sara's politics, like Sara's transnational politics and wanting to look beyond uh, the nation state. Um, so this is on a global level, but to go back and, you know, uh, to the local level, I think that um, a sense that we had or, you know, that also I personally had during the uprisings in Lebanon was this feeling of being completely isolated from other revolutions that happened elsewhere, despite trying to make the link in one way or another. And as has been, you know, uh, talked about in terms of moral panics, if we look at how moral panics work in different parts of the world, there is the sexuality element and there's the migration element and they all come hand in hand. So for example, in Lebanon, that would be, you know, a gay marriage for some reason, although it's not even on the table and like Syrian refugees. And we're not really sure how these overlap, but if we look at how they become mechanisms of the state, in order to maintain the nation state borders uh, firmly in place and uh, enact the performance of citizenship and an image of what a citizen looks like, then you know, we can look at those moral panics as tools of population control the same way they are on the international level in terms of you know, um, whose narrative is miserable enough, who can produce a miserable enough narrative in order to have access to uh, some of the migration rights. Um, and so visibility in that context is not about, you know, playing into the West, because we will never play into the West, really, unless we're working for, you know, specifically, uh, specific, uh, you know, uh, state agencies, which is really not the case. Uh, but I think that visibility in that case um, is a way to transcend those nation state borders, because by taking the risk of visibility, what we are doing really is, you know, is leaving a mark that uh, through social media, through like the online world right now, um, can really reach out to other revolutions happening in other places. Uh, and I think this is a moment that we have seen despite the, you know, the isolation uh, across borders, that was enacted in, in different ways. It is something that we have seen in terms of transnational and regional organizing um, that happened, you know, whether spontaneously or around uh, specific revolutionary moments in recent years. I think um, in terms of the and I have, I've also seen some, th thank you for the comments about the um, the limits of the critique of visibility politics in the in the chat. Um, I, I think that sometimes the kind of, there is a romanticization of, um, of, um, of queer survival in not just the MENA, but the sort of global South majority world more generally. Um, and I think the critique of, um, you know, the politics of visibility as either as a Western strategy or whatever is kind of rooted in this um, romanticization or fetishization of survival in oppressive contexts and also um, essentially then limits the queer subject in a context like the MENA to survival um, and nothing else. Um, and I was thinking, you know, in line with everything that's been said, particularly though, um, what Malak was saying about Sara's desire to return to Egypt um, and desire to be in Egypt um, and how important it is to also think about that desire, but then also the fact that she died in exile in a country that frames itself as one of the most queer friendly places in the world, thinking about that in, in relation to everything that Hiwa just said, um, the way in which that act then undermines this idea that you know the west versus the rest when it comes to um to, to sexuality and also that you know that it it is um you know that that people shouldn't have to choose 
um, a, a, a life that they do not want in exile and a life that um, to, you know, um, drives, makes them miserable in exile or a nation state that drives them underground for fear of what might happen if they become visible, right? And so I think that's why I was really struck by what Sara said about, you know, this is, you know, about the right to dissent and the right to be visible before it's even about the 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 right to rights or the the right to safety and and that I think that's the the, the paradox here, right? Is that there is almost that there is something necessary, I think, about a visibility politics. Um, but then at the same time, we have to contend with what Malak is talking about, about a state that is actively trying to make you visible, actually, that is actively trying to find you, even if you're hiding, because it needs you to be public, because that is beneficial to moral panics, right? Um, so I guess my question, which is obviously not an easy question to address, but I think is is a political question that we have to contend with. If the you know the politics of visibility is necessary, but at the same time is a tool of the state almost. Um, so kind of setting aside the the West versus East argument, but really thinking about how the state is weaponizing visibility, but also its kind of necessity. What does that mean, or what does that mean for politics in the day to day, or what does that mean for dissent more broadly? Um, and I mean, I don't think we're going to necessarily come out of here with answers, but I think it's important that we that we have these conversations, right? Um, Sophie, there was one um, incident that happened. Um, maybe I'll start with an example to then start begin answering your question, which, as you said, is is, is, is a much bigger question, but there was an incident in Lebanon last summer. It was around this time, if I remember correctly, it was Pride Month and um, this, um, what is Exotica like? Uh, there was a billboard, um, a rainbow flower billboard. Botanical, it's a flower shop, right? Exotica. Flower shop. So this was a, a billboard that is an ad for this flower shop that was celebrating. The billboard basically had flowers in the rainbow color. Um, and um, a group um, of like right-wing Christian um like how, I don't know like how you would describe them. They're like um how would you describe them, Sophie Jnoder Rab? Uh, soldiers of God, uh they are a Christian right wing. Christian right wing, like they're the local, they're the, the uh, they operate locally and they um uh, are affiliated with a banker and so and they're supposed to now have like they do like neighborhood neighborhood watch kind of security in Christian areas of the city. Um, Self-appointed vigilantes is a great way of saying it. So yeah. um, Christian vigilantes essentially that tore down this um, this billboard um, and you know went on uh, uh, online uh, threatening, uh, you know, calling out the deviants and, uh, uh, you know, uh, threatening them with violence um, and proclaiming that these, uh, this is not what our area is about. This is not, you know, we don't, we're, we're not, you know, we don't support queer rights, um, rainbows are haram. Um, so, so what happened, um, and I'm giving this example to, to talk about an actual political situation where activists had to decide how to respond um, to what was happening. And there was a split at the time between people who wanted to uh, mobilize and to have a demonstration to basically voice very loudly and clearly that we are no longer in a time where such threats uh, and such public reactions and intimidation can go uh, unchecked and there was another uh, group of people and we're talking about activists activists not just queer activists but activists who were um, you know organizing during the, during the uprising and even before then student activists um queer feminist leftist um and so the other group thought that no we need to be mindful about safety and security 
And actually, we cannot guarantee what will happen um, if we were to actually hold, you know, this demonstration. Um, and then eventually, because they couldn't come to an agreement, but it was also a case where, um, because when you talk about activism, you know, we, we think of, sometimes it, it comes across as this like rosy picture of people actually like in harmony um, with a unified solid political vision, which is not often not the case. And so the split was about whether or not it was um, smart and efficient and, uh, and, and safe to have a demonstration uh, against homophobia, basically. Um, especially given the volatile uh, situation in, in Lebanon today. And uh, the, the march was canceled, the demonstration was canceled. And I think um, maybe I'm bringing this, I'm bringing it up because the question of visibility, visibility is such a big term. And we, I feel like we, we put so much under it. And sometimes the answer really is about what exactly are we talking about? So is it about, you know, um, uh, having a, a, a pride parade or is it about the right to hold hands in the street or is it about the right to protest when actually your humanity is being degraded? So what is actually visibility politics? Um, um, and, and this example I gave because, I mean, I can see, I can see both sides of, of the, the rationale on both sides. Um, at the time, I was inclined to actually support a public um, manifestation against this. Um, and I was, you know, I was thinking about, in addition to visibility, this idea of safety and security and the way it's been circulating um, in political spaces, also what are its limits as a sort of the political horizon that we set uh, for ourselves. Um, especially when we have this um, not dissonance, but like asymmetry between what we are willing to say online and what kind of politics we are willing to profess publicly in digital spaces uh, on the internet versus what we are actually willing and able to do um, in our physical locations. Um, and I think this also is a question that when we think of um, the critiques of the politics of visibility or thinking about queer struggles today, it really depends where you are writing from, uh, what's your out, so, you know, what, what do you see from where you are standing? What are the stakes of the actions that you take? Um, and this is where I think, you know, there's, if there's like the, the online discourse, there's what's happening on the ground. And then there is, you know, an academia, for example, as, as one place where knowledge is produced, where critique is produced, um, you feel that there is also a, a particular a way of thinking about a problem that is very much, in, you know, like shaped by the location uh, um, from where it is being, uh, you know, articulated, which is fine. We all write from somewhere and, and, and think politically from somewhere, but that location that goes unacknowledged. Um, and so I think with Sara, there is um, a transnational Arab queer public that sort of appeared uh, through this process of public mourning. Um, and we thought about this connection because of the political actions, um, memorials, uh, that uh, uh, vigils that were organized, the connections between queers in the diaspora and queers in the homeland or, you know, whatever you want to call it. But um, so we saw the connection, but we also are reminded that there is also a difference. And I think we need, as we think of this you know, category, um, queer Arabs, which you also posed in, in, in thinking of this round table, um, not, to, not to want to gloss over the differences uh, that exist, not to think of it as a sort of homogeneous experience uh, that's binding us all, but to think of how we can come together and think together through differences, right? To imagine, if we were to imagine a, a unity of political vision, um, 
how do we how do we think from these differences? Riwa, do you want to go here? Uh, Sabiha, do you want to say something? I was going to ask, actually, if Sabiha can, sorry to keep doing this to you, Sabiha, but if you can translate from uh, English to Arabic the question um, or the overall subject that we're talking about for Malak. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So um, um, that has to be in Arabic, right? I have to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Malak, uh, you know, so can on إذا بدك الوجه الآخر you know the visibility وكيف قدرت connect هالمختلف publics مع بعض بس كمان yeah بس كمان سارة قالت لنا أول سارة مراد قالت لنا إنه وقت ال حتى إذا هل كن شفنا هال overlaps right والأشياء تجي مع بعضها لازم نضلنا منتبهين على إنه المجتمع المثلي بالعالم العربي منو شغلي وحدي رايت منو في كتير اختلافات في يا فا I I I will leave it here بس مبدئيا هذا السؤال عم نحكي عنه كيف سياسة مش حاسه إن أنا فهمت السؤال قوي أنا أسفة جدا صبيحة لكن خليني أرجع له خليني أكتب ونت في هيك غيس براسي و. بلك I can give it a go. يا ما أو غيوة أو سارة أو صوفي كان. Okay so كان سؤال عن إنه كيف إنه the visibility بتكون مختلفة لأنه يعني السياسات اللي لها علاقة بال بالدول يعني بتجرب. يعني يصير الفيزيبيليتي طريقة من الطرق يعني المعتمدة تا يبينوا الأشخاص يلي رح إنه يلي عم بيكونوا مضطهدين من قبل الدول أو النظام يعني بينما في طريقة فيزيبيليتي تانية يلي إلا عليها أكثر بي إنه كيف نحنا بنقدر نقاوم وكيف نقدر نحنا إنه نتنظم بين بعض فهنا هيدول الاثنين فيزيبيليتي اللي كنا عم نجرب نحكي عنهم وملك ما بعرف اذا بتحب تجاوب بس انا في بلش اذا اه اكيد تفضلي غيوة اوكي اوكي سو بيسكلي اي واز ثينكينج اباوت لايك وين وي توكينج اباوت فيزيبيليتي وي whether something as a tool that is used by states versus as a tool or a strategy that is used by uh, communities or people organizing for a reason or another, I think we're talking about different things and different goals. Uh, being made visible by the state or by regimes or as a feature of a moral panic, uh, is actually a way to preempt invisibility. So leading you to invisibility in some way, because this kind of visibility would be uh, a way to target certain people and then move them through a mechanism that we have become familiar with, which is basically prison uh, disappearances, uh, in some cases, even murder. Uh, and then, a lot of time followed by exile, which, you know, is also in, in many ways uh, Sarah's uh, a story. Whereas when we talk about visibility as, as a strategy that is mobilized, I think it comes as a counter visibility uh, to what is being done here. So we're not talking about the same thing because this counter visibility is used uh, in a way to to be able to mobilize uh, not only across borders, but also across temporalities. Um, before I continue with that, I want to talk about disability for, for a tiny bit. And I think that there's a point to be made here in the sense that um, we become 
like states force us into st different states of disability that are more or less permanent um, by injury, by, you know, like the moment we, we go to protest in certain contexts, then we, beca we become bodies that are easily wounded, uh, killed, detained. Um, and like this idea of disappearance, is has like is very much linked to disability and this like how disability has been theorized but to go back to the idea of how is it that we resist uh public resistance is not the only way to resist it's the only way that we have seen uh so far uh, uh like maybe on you know mainstream tv or whatever um but there is something to uh resisting with our disabilities, with our illnesses, et cetera, uh, that is maybe more private, but that very much has to do with the, this notion of how is it that we deploy care? And deploying care is in and of itself a way to resist this invisibilization that happens through uh, uh, targeting of certain individuals and communities. So this was an important parenthesis to go back to, to the idea that uh, actually mourning is a form of protest. The fact that we still mourn Sara three years down the line means that this erasure was made impossible. Uh, and to me, it is a form of like, how is it that we can mobilize around that um, even you know when we're no longer in the same geographies, when we're no longer in the same temporality, um, and maybe this brings us to the idea of hope, because I think that hope is misunderstood as, you know, being naive or being simplistic. And why is it that mourning is related to hope? Um, I mean. If, there is a tension to go back to Jose Munoz and uh, Lisa Duggan, like the dialectical tension between hope and hopelessness. But I do think that in mourning, there is hope. There is still hope for something else, for being able to build something that is different. Um, and I join, I always join Mariam Kaba's, um, you know, reflection on hope as a discipline. So it's not something that will be given to us by the world, by systems of power, but it is something that we have, like discipline is interesting here because it is a practice, but it's, it is also a way um, to strategize and to keep strategizing uh, in the way that Sara had envisioned, basically. Can I add? Uh... Thank you, uh, Riwa. Actually, when you were talking about the, um, where, where everyone actually was talking about the politics of visibility, especially when Sarah was, you know, yeah, it made me think that the visibility, right, of, um, or, the, or the visibilization, let's say, of LGBT bodies, right, in the sense that they are being coerced into throwing themselves, immersing themselves into, you know, some degree of visibility for the sake of the state to prosecute them. But it made me also think that the visibility of LGBT bodies is always accompanied or also gives rise to the visibility of other groups, right? Other, um, um, yeah. And one of these groups is this uh, um, soldiers of God or, you know, that uh, Sarah was uh, telling us about. And in the sense, right, right, these are also groups that self-identify as marginalized, right? Uh, also by the state, also by society. If if they are, if we are thinking about them as uh, failing, right, in their masculinity, unable to attain their, uh, uh, you know, societal expectations of the perfect man, uh, etc. And the reason I want to say this is this is in as much as we should highlight, uh, you know, the potential of transnational and diasporic solidarity, I think we should also think about um, this increasing trend, right? There are similar transnational 
ultra homophobic, ultra transphobic alliance uh, taken uh, uh, place. Um, so for example, during the Lebanese civil war, the sons of uh, God would have been unthinkable, right? To think, to place them alongside poor Sunni men in Tripoli. So Lebanon is in extreme precarity. In my city, Tripoli, the last two mobilizations that happened in the last few months were only about the refusal of LGBT, uh, anything that has to do with LGBT, right? Uh, very similar to also the increased, uh, to borrow from Sophie chauvinistic rhetoric being used by post-colonial leaders, right? Uganda, Russia, China, and this uh, want, right? To go back to the authentic, to the heteronormative, heteropatriarch. So yeah, the, the, their links, just like you was telling us, right? At the temporal level, historical, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's imperative that we attend um, to these different um, yeah, spaces. Thank you. Uh, um, thanks, Abiha. Um, so uh, Malak um, sends her apologies um, and she's um, had to leave because she's been struggling um, with following the conversation, um, um, given the the sort of that we had to sort of do the translation ad hoc. I, I kind of, given that we're talking about transnational diasporic solidarity, I, I want to say a, a few things on that and also take responsibility because I, um, there was a miscommunication. I hadn't realized that she would need translation. But I think that that should have been that should always be anticipated as in if we are going to do an event in honor of Sada Higazi and if we're going to host a conversation about uh, queer politics in the MENA region, um, then at the very least it should be done in both English and Arabic. Um, and so that was an oversight on my part. Um, and so I, I I, uh, I, yeah, I want to take responsibility for that, and I've apologized to her and also apologized to anybody else affected by that, but we do have to think about who we're speaking to when we host these things in English, and um, it is a very obvious question, and I think it's just, um, I guess, uh, something that we should be, I should have been more attentive to, but yeah, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that, um, and um um, yeah, especially given the discussion that we're we're having. Um, I don't know if anybody else wanted to say anything about that. Um, I think we can remedy this, maybe a little bit with delay, but I think we could remedy it by um, working properly, you know, on translations um, and maybe use our institutional privilege, right? I'm at an institute, most probably I could ask for a budget uh, to have uh, the... the um, you know, the conversation dubbed and translated uh, properly. But uh, yeah, I, I agree uh, with what Sophie said. And I also want to add that when during the period of organizing the panel, I remember at first telling Sophie, no, no, we should have more people, you know, from Egypt. But then again, we fall back into the paradox, right, of visibility, non being visible, etc. And it, was, it wasn't easy, actually, to find the... Uh, um, someone you know from Egypt who is going to be willing to be present in a public space like this but uh, yeah thank you Sophie for reminding us thanks Sabiha um so before we open it up to the audience I did want to build on some of the things that were said um and kind of invite maybe thinking on this but I was thinking about Sara's own politics her transnational politics her intersectional politics, um, and then what Sara Mrad was saying about, you know, how we think about and deal with um, the idea of political risk um, and safety. And then I was thinking about, again, this idea of how tactics travel um, and um, how, um, yeah, how tactics travel and how strategies travel um, and thinking about how, uh, moral panics in the Western context are being challenged. So I'm thinking essentially of, you know, instead of thinking in a kind of identity politics way about learning from the activism of the, or the most visible kind of mainstream activism of um, LGBT rights activists in the West, for example, the, if I take the UK as an example, so a kind of single issue 
uh, citizen focused um, um, LGBT rights activism that is aimed primarily at um, those who are already most privileged. Um, if we look at the activism around um, uh, migration, anti-border activism, migrants' rights activism, again, using a context like the UK, of course, this intersects with queer politics um, uh, because you know, my, many of these migrants will be queer, but I'm thinking at, about the migrant as the target of moral panics, uh, the primary target of moral panics in a context like the UK, for example. The migrants are obviously also a primary target of moral panics in the Middle East, but I'm thinking about the ways in which um, solidarity activism around migration takes an approach to political risk and safety that is kind of aimed at distributing based on privilege and based on positionality. So if you look at it, you look at people who attempt to stop uh, deportation flights in the UK, these will always be citizens and they will most likely be white, right? So you do not put the person that is at most risk, you do not put the migrant um, in the face of um, the police in order to stop a deportation. And so I think there are, there are really interesting there's really there are really interesting things happening in um, a context like the UK, which, which is also increasingly becoming very much a police state. So um, um, and using tactics that would be um, to oppress, uh, to suppress um, um, dissent that would be familiar to people who, uh, from the region as well. To look at to maybe think about how we don't necessarily need to have this. Like we can think about risk and we can think about safety in, you know, through these ideas of distribution and through kind of positionality and privilege, which then necessitates a kind of um, intersectional solidarity based politics where it cannot just be the person that is oppressed that is lobbying for their own rights, right? So I was thinking about also how we learn from um, activism around issues that might not on the surface look related, but are actually deeply entangled if we are using that um, lens of moral panics um, and what they serve and who deploys them. Um, so I don't know um, if there are any if there are any thoughts or contributions on that before we um, open it up to everybody else. Should I go? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sophie. Um, yeah, um, I think I, I agree with you, right? And this goes back to your opening statement today. Um, you know, when we want to think about uh, doing, um, you know, thinking together as in doing, right? Uh, because when we think together, we can make the links uh, between all these uh, seemingly um, the, the distinct right or uh, the bodies and spaces and um, so and this goes back to for example for me when I think about moral panics and um, even in the context you know of uh, queer sexuality um, I think I have to ask myself you know what is what do I gain theoretically, but also in terms materially in terms of activism, right? When I'm going to focus on uh, queerness or queer sexuality um, on its own, right? Uh, why don't I think about sexuality as you know a larger uh, uh, domain, right? A larger tool of control by the state, which intersect, which, which is not necessarily limited, right, to queer body. Everybody everybody as in every biological body has a sexuality right and which automatically means it's going to uh, bring forth um you know um good sides bad sides right which are usually going to be regulated by the same state right with its military with its uh, heteropatriarchal elite uh, etc and uh, i think this is why you know thinking about sexuality Right. Um, more broadly, I think can help us understand uh, state uh, control, the workings, the workings of state uh, uh, powers, 
um, not only at the local level, but also at the, uh, you know, transnational level. And um, yeah, and, um, and the same, right? When we want to think about queerness, also to think about it, you know, as maybe if we want to affect intersectional solidarity, uh, where we recognize difference, right, without uh, erasing it, um, because different oppressions come from different histories, uh, hence the difference. But um, um, also when you think about queerness, if we think about it as, you know, something that contradicts the, the, the status quo, the normative. So in this case, the migrant definitely becomes a queer figure, right? Um, whether we're talking about the, now the latest scapegoat in the UK is the, are the Albanians, right? And in Lebanon, we've seen an unprecedented uh, level of uh, anti-Syrian sentiment um, in these days and age, right? It coincides a little bit with the sons of God. It coincides a little bit with the uh, failed masculinity in uh, poor neighborhoods from Tripoli. And they're all linked. They're absolutely all linked. And, um, you know, and I think this speaks directly even to the politics of Sarah Hagazi, right? To think intersectionally, um, to think about class, uh, to think about uh, different publics, right? And, um, yeah, think about our relationship uh, to them. Thank you. Hey, Sabiha, can I, can I jump in to, to add one more, not to just maybe... Um, mention one thing is I, I feel um, we've been a very like state centric in our discussion so far. Um, and I think it's very important to think of, especially with, um, because we're thinking about um, what happened with Sara, we're reflecting on the role of um, the state and manufacturing moral panics. But I think often what falls from view is also society and the social. Um, and maybe just to make sure we, we keep this in our thoughts as well. Um, we started by with a question about the queer responses to Sarah's suicide um, online um, and what we can infer from that. But if we go um, further back, um, you know, moral panic starts uh, online with the with the this, you know the circulation of her photo um, with the rainbow flag. So there's and this maybe also speaks to your question about risk, Sophie. Um, you know, the the exposing oneself in such a way, having your picture taken in one context, especially because we're dealing. A lot of the, the, these politics are, are unfolding, you know, through these digital infrastructures that that we that, um, were using. Um, so, so what happens when this image moves from one context to another context? Uh, the risk there, but also where I was going with that thought is that there was a, a you know. Um, a response, a very uh, violent response from people um, to to this uh, image and what it stood for. Um, and so, when we're talking about this, you know, queerness as depending on how you define it, as some impulse towards freedom that sometimes crystallizes around the way we want to live uh, and our bodies, our genders, our sexualities. So if we, um, if we go back to that, then the, there's, a, there's a social struggle, a real social struggle. Um, and it's not just with the state. And if we are to understand and diagnose what kind of power we are dealing with, then yes, for sure, we need to um, think about the, the state in relationship to the political authoritarianism that we're living through in relation to global capitalism and relation to ecological disaster, right? The state as an agent. But if we were to think more about power um, in our societies, I think, I think there's something also that cannot be subsumed under the, under the state. <clears> 
Sorry, Sabiha, can you repeat what you were saying? Uh, I didn't say anything, but I saw your lips moving and I was like, uh, we can't hear you. Um, but actually, if I can just say that, yeah, I concur with uh, everything that Sarah said. Uh, <laughs> and I don't see how, you know, I see them both uh, two sides of the same, uh, you know, uh, problem. But, but and I, I think maybe I think and I'm drawing I'm thinking here because we're talking about Sarah as an activist and um but Sarah was also a thinker and a writer and I think part of our part of you know why we're organizing this front why we're still thinking not just mourning her three years later but still thinking um through her and with her um is that she's also someone who after you know after what happened to her she wanted to write about it and make sense of it and 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 put it out there. Um, and so it's this, like what something happened to her, why did it happen? How do we prevent it from from happening further? And yeah, honoring, I guess her her legacy in in this way is to um, is to do more of what she was doing as well, which is to, uh, and I'm thinking here in terms of the state, this piece, the piece that she wrote for Madame Masr, um, where she was putting her finger on 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 these different, you know, there's there's a, a hegemonic approach to power where these different forces intersect and collide, right? Where you have the the Muslim Brotherhood in bed with the with the Egyptian state, uh, with the Egyptian bourgeoisie. So, so just you know, this invitation to think, um, to 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 have a more um, a, a complex understanding of of um, of the power we are facing. I think that 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 is really crucial, and I think the, I, I think that often we we end up fixating on the state, and on you know the genealogy of things, even when it comes to society or you know the sort of prevalence of queer phobia within our societies you know focusing on the material conditions of possibility as part of the critique of uh, orientalism and cultural and cultural essentialism right but then that also then you know means especially when our fixation in our critique is on the western gaze or the wep western weaponization of middle eastern queer phobia homo nationalism etc that means that there is an avoidance of dealing with society at large or the you know sedimentation of queer phobia within that society right as and you can you know and i think this this is why that engaging with sara's intellectual work and the importance of that intellectual work and of writing and disseminating knowledge within your society that is speaking to that society's uh, queer phobia and to also that symbiotic relationship between society and the state, right? So there's a, the state can weaponize moral panics because those morals are considered fundamental by a large part of the population, right? You cannot disentangle those things from one another. So if our focus is purely on a critique of the state and we do not engage with society's complicity, then we're never really going to take that politics forward, right? And I think that fear comes from the Orientalist gaze, the Western gaze, um, um, and is often a fear or is often something you see predominate in conversations that happen either in the diaspora or in the sort of Western academy when it comes to Middle East studies. And I think the conversations that people are having on the ground, the work that people like Sada were doing on the ground in the region, is different because it has to be different, and I think we have to we have to contend with the kind of those of us who are removed from the region, uh, or, or or diasporic for a variety of reasons, or migrants. The ways in which the the analyses that we do kind of absolve society over and over again of its of its complicity in these in these processes and these modes of violence. Um, Um, 
maybe first a few thoughts on uh, place-based struggles, because I think it has to do also with the, uh, the discussion on translation uh, as well. Um, I think it's okay to recognize that certain conversations happen in certain places. Um, I think we, we always want to be like, you know, uh, really inclusive and do things, you know, in a way that, that brings conversations together. But we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to do that all the time. Um, and so it's okay to be like, this is a conversation for this audience, and then have other conversations for different audiences. Um, so just to add, like maybe translation would have, you know, um, made this conversation more possible in certain ways, but also like translation as an annex is kind of a, you know, just a way like to fix things, but not really address the root issue, which is that this is a place-based conversation in, in different ways. And it's okay, like it's totally okay. Um, and I think this links to what we are saying because in a way doing transnational work is looking with and beyond place-based struggles um, in the sense that we recognize, and this ties to what Sophie was saying in terms of how do we enact solidarity, um, we recognize that there are place-based struggles taking place um, at all times, uh, there are people resisting, there are people dissenting, and how is it then that we can make the links wherever we are with uh, these uh, groups of people? Um, however, <laughs> this comes with the recognition and to tie with uh, what Sarah was just saying, that very often uh, we would be in the same, let's say revolutionary space and then come to the realization that we are working towards very divergent visions, uh, political projects and visions of the world. Um, so what does this do then? Like, how do we deal with that? Um, and, it, and I think it is something that, you know, we come face to face with in the sense that different people or different groups of people have different relations to power and benefit differently from power. And I don't think that, that there's one answer, but I am reminded, for instance, of the conversation on prisons that took place in, in Egypt and lawyer and activist Mahinur al-Masri saying how prisons um, can be seen as a rallying point despite different political projects happening in Egypt that are very divergent. So how is it then that we all can organize, um, not across those differences, because sometimes those differences are way too divergent in terms of what we are doing politically, uh, but then how is it that we can mobilize differently? Um, so for me, it's, it's really about the strata of, of, of power and how is it that we can uh, look at that. And I think that solidarity is not always possible. <laughs> uh, but when it is, then, you know, we have also to recognize the limitations of it. And here I'm talking about solidarity um, across groups, across uh, communities. And I know I keep going back to the point about care, but I do think that care that is intra-communal um, I mean, this is exactly why I was speaking about care in the sense that, um, yes, there is a social fabric that is embedded in, you know, um, how is it that the nation or citizenship are formed, uh, but also what are the different political projects that are happening at the same time? And we find ourselves not being able to look for this kind of care that is necessary, not just to our survival, but also to, you know, living like, life with dignity, you know, as communities. And it is a type of labor and work that we have to do uh, with each other and for each other. Um, and I know what you said, Sarah, in terms of, you know, thinking with uh, Sarah Higazi, uh, but for me, uh, affect is also a way of thinking with 
with Sara Hegazi. Um, like I don't see, you know, like the emotions, and not that not that you said otherwise. I'm just like trying to expand on it, you know. But I don't see the emotional response as, you know, um, like for me, the emotional response that this like that Sara could elicit even three years down the line is also a way to 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 continue thinking with her and through her, basically. Thanks so much, Rua. Um, I'm conscious of time and we only have slightly over 20 minutes. So um, I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. 